question. Thank you. Well, this is a great pleasure for me. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen Kaufman, who is going to be speaking to us today, uh, I still think of as being 25 years old uh, when she came here to graduate school. But uh, we go back even further because her parents have been friends of mine for mm, 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> Kathleen was born into historic preservation. She had no choice about her career path. Uh, her father was one of the rare few who got to live on the lawn at the University of Virginia uh, before he came here to law school. And over the course of years, over three terms as mayor of Carl Gables, uh, he saved the important buildings there that other otherwise would have been demolished. And in fact, he still is a member today of our University of Florida uh, Historic St. Augustine Board, which oversees the 38 state-owned properties in St. Augustine. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, she went off to Virginia, which was not surprising, for her undergraduate degree in historic preservation uh, before returning to uh, her home state uh, to get a master's in historic preservation here at UF. And uh, I would also like to recognize Jay Reeves, who's sitting on the second row, who is Gainesville's preeminent historic preservation architect. And uh, I know uh, he worked with Sue Gaintner in designing her wonderful house on the prairie, and also with uh, Henry um, <coughs> uh, in uh, designing the house in the duck pond area that uh, uh, Robert Dean's son now owns. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> Jay, uh, I taught 60 years ago or something like that. Um, in any event, um, Kathleen has had a number of uh, important historic preservation positions in the state, and I have her uh, resume here, but it's not up to date. Um, what is the correct title in Gainesville now, your title, Historic Preservation Officer. But she also was appointed recently to the um, uh, Florida Historical Commission, which uh, was, um, uh, forgotten what it was when I was president of it, but I drafted the legislation. Yeah, okay, that's what it was. And her father was on that council with me. So anyway, it's a great um, honor to, to ask Kathleen to talk to us about the trials and tribulations of historic preservation because she does so from many uh, vantage points. Well, I, I like to move around, so I'm going to use the mic off off of the stand, but um, thank you so much for having me. My father, who's probably watching via your live stream, always tells me you need to start off with a joke or something funny so that people lightens the mood and people don't fall asleep. I don't really have anything clever to say this morning, <laughs> except that, you know, it's State of the Union week. And so now I'm giving you State of the Union of Preservation in Gainesville, but I do not expect you to clap after everything I say. <laughs> and, um, oh, where's the, oh, away we go. I have a lot of information to give you, and I'm going to try and uh, keep going. You're welcome, but you're welcome to stop me if you, if you have a question, or we could just take questions at the end, whatever you prefer. So um, the life and times of a preservation officer. It's, it's an interesting position, and I've been the historic preservation officer for three or four municipalities, three municipalities, and Miami-Dade County, and I also have some experience in the nonprofit world. I was the executive director of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation for a few years, um, but I love, I love the fact that working at a local government level, you actually have the opportunity to affect real change because you're working with 
ordinances and you're working within a regulatory framework. So um, Gainesville has five historic districts. <clears throat> and here's a map of kind of where all of them are at once. And obviously they're centered around university and Maine, and that's the oldest part of the city. This does not mean we don't have other neighborhoods that shouldn't be designated, but we just have not gotten to that yet. Um, I would love to expand this effort I'm going through them really quick, you know, we have the Northeast Historic District. M many of you probably know this as the Duck Pond neighborhood. Uh, this was um, one of the oldest residential areas in Gainesville, um, platted in 1854. And a lot of the architectural styles are, a, it's a lovely mix of architectural styles. You have some Mediterranean, you have a lot of Queen Anne, um, you also have the Thomas Center in the center of it, which used to be the Thomas Hotel. It started off, it was started off as the Thomas home, and then it turned into the hotel. And the Southeast Historic District is kind of known as our bed and breakfast district. It is a, a wonderful collection of Queen Anne homes. Um, there's some, um, Second Empire, there's really some beautiful structures in there. And this is where the uh, merchants and professionals would uh, usually lived at the turn of the century. Pleasant Street Historic District. This is uh, one of our oldest African-American communities, and it's, but it's the only African-American community that is currently protected under designation. And there's several churches in this neighborhood, and a lot of the homes are simple frame vernacular structures. And when I say vernacular, that means there isn't really a style, but it was built by a local builder using local materials, and it was built, you know, to really reflect the area and uh, of where uh, in the neighborhood it was built. Um, this. <laughs> It's a really wonderful neighborhood to walk around because it actually doesn't have a lot of sidewalks and curbs and a lot of that hard infrastructure that some of the more formal neighborhoods have. And all these, a lot of the houses and buildings have um, front porches and you see neighbors out walking and sitting on their front porch all the time. University Heights North, these buildings range from the 1920s to the 1950s. Um, it includes the area known as University Terrace, uh, Florida Court subdivisions. So we start to, we're starting to move a little bit later in, uh, through the decades. And these are the typical houses that you would see in this area. And then we have University Heights South. And this is the one that's kind of directly between the university and downtown. It sits just east of 13th and south of University. Um, a lot of these were mid 20th century and another beautiful mix of house, housing styles. There's Mission, there's Mediterranean, there's Colonial Revival. Uh, this is where a lot of the professors and staff as the university was growing uh, wanted to live. So, of course, I mean, I wouldn't have a job if I didn't have some challenges. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the challenges first and get the sad part out of the way. Um, but we do have some challenges and I don't think the challenges are not over. You, we can't overcome them. I think there is a way we can attack these issues and in a way that is good for all of Gainesville. It's st that still saves the historic nature of Gainesville but allows it to grow like every city is needing to, quite frankly. And here you have um, a series of photos of the Hippodrome. And there it was in construction. It was the original courthouse and post office. There it was in construction and there's um, a 19, early 1980s photo of it. And you know now we have a Hyatt Hotel right on its, right catty corner to it. Um, 
I have many feelings about this. <laughs> and, you know, when you look up historic Gainesville on the internet, or if you type in Gainesville on the internet, that, that view of the Hippodrome down that street is always the first thing that pops up because that is our pride and joy. Not to say we didn't need a hotel down there, but probably there should have been some architectural overview, oversight. Uh, there could have been other ways to place it on this site where it didn't immediately impact the visual aspect of looking at the Hippodrome now. And now you see this massive building to the side. But why is that? That's because downtown is not designated as one of the districts. It's not designated. And previous preservation officers have tried in the past, and the board has tried in the past. But, um, you know, downtown properties are typically owned by a handful of people, and they own a lot of the property down there. So it's very diff it's been very difficult to get um, any momentum going on the effort to do a downtown district, but this is a big problem. Because a few years ago, um, when building construction wasn't so rampant, and the city officials were very worried about not getting any development down here, most of downtown is now blanketed with was upzoned to like 10 or 11 stories. So the fact that none of this is protected is a big problem. And there you see, that was uh, 2018, right before, um, it used to be a parking lot, <laughs> uh, just, to the, just to the right of the Hippodrome. And then this is the building we have. Interestingly enough, if you go by that building today, you'll see some of the siding appears to be coming off, because I don't know that it was really constructed that great, but I don't know. Florida Theater, I, like, so none of these buildings that you know in downtown are protected. It would be great to be able to bring back the old historic marquee on this. Typical stuff that you see downtown. Some of this is from the 1800s, some of this building stock, and we don't have any protection over it. Now, I will say, you know, and if you hear people complain about downtown and it's like, oh, it's overrun with students, like who wants to go? Don't like if you hear people say that, say, hey, don't 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 blame the students for downtown being horrible. If there were things for nice things for people to go to, then we would go if we had bookstores, if we had an art cinema. Um. In fact, this building would make a fantastic art cinema. And I know a city called Coral Gables has done a really fantastic job with their new art cinema. But, you know, there's, there's things that can be done with downtown to really end the street. And some of the streets and sidewalks are so horrible, you would, most people would trip and fall. So I get why a lot of people don't really want to go to downtown right now. But it has potential. And there's some property owners, like Scott Shillington, who owns this whole block on the left, who's doing a really fantastic job. He's the, he's the owner of the top, and he own, owns quite a bit of the buildings downtown. And he's really trying very hard to not only bring like fun businesses and restaurants back to that area, but also restoring the historic buildings. But we don't know how long, you know, people like that will continue owning these structures. You know, the old Firestone building on the left, the old Firestone garage, um, the vacant lot right across from it, that's an 11 story building coming in there. Now the, I wanted, I, I wanted to put the Siegel building here for comparison. The Siegel building is actually a historic building, amazingly enough at 10 stories, but you see how narrow it is? It's narrow and, and, it's, and it's tall, but it, it's not taking up the entire block. This building that's gonna be built next to the Firestone building will definitely take up the entire block. I think it's a Jimmy Buffett Margaritaville slash hotel. That's um, University and Third. And um, so 
when you have these massive buildings that just consume the entire block, it is a very different feel. Here's another one of our recent challenges. Um, this, is, this is an outline of the district I was telling you about that sits between uni the university and downtown, University Heights uh, South. And the purple and the blue um, graphic there, the purple are the contributing structures, meaning they're really the, all the historic buildings within that district. And the blue are non-contributing. And you can see it is full, it is full of historic buildings, which is why we made it a district. For whatever reason, a little chunk of it was cut out near the top of that district because at the time they made the district, there weren't any buildings on the on the site and or some of them were getting ready to be torn down. And they just wanted to not include all that. Well, that has since become very problematic because uh, the red outline that you see there is a new um, new building coming in. And the Historic Preservation Board fought very valiantly against that. I'm sorry, can you see? Fought very valiantly against this um, and so this is the new swamp restaurant. So I'm trying to show you kind of where the new swamp restaurant is and you can see the swamp restaurant in its reincarnation, which is so weird because I used to go to the swamp in the old location. Uh, have not been to the new one yet, but it's a two story. It's a two story building and it fits in really well with the rest of the neighborhood because here's what the rest of the neighborhood looks like houses like this. Okay, some of them have been turned into businesses, but the historic building is still there. The historic scale is still there. And the intent of the neighborhood still feels like a residential neighborhood. So this red outline is where this new building is going. How's that for a pretty design? We have no design review. We have no architectural review board. So if that parcel had been in the historic district, the historic preservation board serves as the architectural reviewing body. Um, so the top graphic, the building all the way to the right is the five story existing infinity hall. It's a really pleasant little building, mostly glass, you know, kind of unassuming. And everything else around this, everything else around this is one and two story. In the middle of a neighborhood, this is not on 13th, this is not on university. <laughs> and we're getting another student housing project, essentially, is what it's gonna be. Now the developers will tell you otherwise, but that's gonna be full of students. And these are the houses right across the street from that facade that you saw. So when they come out their front doors, they're gonna look at a 12 story building and not a very pleasant one at that. Here's a shot of that site where they're gonna be building it. There's Infinity Hall on the right is five stories and everything to the left is historic district. Infinity Hall is not in the historic district. So this is 10th street. And that's where the historic district ends. Here's another fun challenge. Uh, anybody recognize this building? Yes, Gainesville Serviceman Center. Exactly right. Now known as the Thelma Bolton Center. Uh, this <laughs> COVID had partially to do with its downfall, but but this the city had let this kind of go for a long time and they were getting ready to renovate it and it had gone through the Historic Preservation Board, but COVID stopped all of that. So it literally sat doing nothing for a few years. And then when we went back to try to start the restoration process again, um, it was determined that it now was failing miserably structurally and needed to be torn down. As you can imagine, um, this building has a very long history in Gainesville. And do you know, at one point, 
4,000 servicemen came through these doors every, every weekend because there were so many uh, bases, air bases and, and Camp Blanding and, you know, all around Gainesville. And these poor kids didn't have anything to do. They were away from their homes and the bases did not have a ton of entertainment for them. So this was the place they could come here and use showers, get a haircut, shave, send mail. They had uh, entertainment for them. They held dances for them where the local girls, I'm sure many weddings happened as a result of this building. Um, girls from the community would come and attend the dances with the um, soldiers. Fascinating history, really fantastic. And then later it became a senior center and rec center. Um, and then it's in its most recent years before it closed, it was um, a community center and rentable space for events and weddings and that sort of thing. Thelma Bolton, the person it was named after, um, actually grew up in Gainesville in the early 1900s. After graduating college, she came back to Gainesville, taught drama and English at Gainesville High School. Um, and she was the lead person who really, when this was built um, in 19, in the early 1940s, she was the person who really imagined, you know, it takes a person, one person can really change a place. She imagined this place as like they're the soldier's home away from home. And so she really got into like programming stuff for them every week and really turned this place into something spectacular. And it was quite, quite the thing for the city of Gainesville at the time. Um, after the, after the war, she ended up, you know, in the fifties through sixties, she was the director of the Florida Folk Festival and the state of Florida awarded her the Florida Folk Heritage Award, which is like the highest honor for her work. Um, she was a fantastic storyteller. She took people's oral histories. She was super, super into, um, retaining those vanishing stories of, of folk life. So that's why it was named after her. She was the first, you know, person to run the program programming there and the director of the servicemen center, but it clearly has some issues, right? Like this is what the inside looks like right now. It's literally being held up with scaffolding from the inside. Uh, we have some walls separating, you know, no big deal. We have um, <laughs> a roof beam that's fallen down and is sitting on top of the AC unit. No big deal. It's problematic. But anybody who knows historic preservation knows this is no problem, right? Like, we do this. This is what we do. So the um, Parks Department, who was who did not take that on, take that responsibility on themselves. They were given this assignment. They came to the Historic Preservation Board with a request to demolish the building. The Historic Preservation Board said, you really need to get a historic architect, a preservation architect, to also give you some numbers on what it would cost to rehabilitate the building. And this fantastic reports available online. It's REG Architects out of West Palm Beach. Um, and the numbers that came back with this were a little over 4 million on the low end, 6 million on the high end, depending on market rate of materials and all that kind of stuff. And they, uh, and the city was contemplating, oh, we're just going to tear it down and rebuild it all for $3 million, which I don't think is an accurate number to re totally rebuild a building. But they came to the Historic Preservation Board again, and the Preservation Board said, look, you can tear off the little wing that's really not been useful for anybody in recent years and build your wing a little bit better so you can have more community space and classrooms and art rooms and dance rooms, but you need to preserve the main piece of it, the big gym gymnasium that everybody knows and loves. 
And that went over very well. And so right now, this is still up in the air um, because it, the, the final say has to be at the city commission. They're the ones with they're the ones that are going to be paying for it. Well, you're the ones that are going to be paying for it, actually. But they're the ones that make that decision. So, you know, this is still an ongoing thing. If you're interested, uh, keep an eye out for it because it should be coming back to commission in March or April. Okay, through, we're through some of our major challenges. Um, some of our successes, this is ongoing. This is not done yet. But this is the Rosewood House on Northwest First Street. Um, beautiful. This is in the Pleasant Street Historic District. Beautiful, beautiful uh, home that if any of you uh, remember our chief building official, Kiefer Calkins, he and his wife restored this about 25, 30 years ago. And uh, they don't they don't currently own it. Uh, another couple owns it, and the, he teaches at UF. But they rented it out to um, some ladies. And one night, a fire started on the top porch and completely destroyed the house. This was maybe you saw this in the news. It was about six months ago. Uh, there's some of the interior photos when we first were taking a look at the condition. Amazingly enough, okay, so we, of course, the insurance company said you needed to you need to take it down. This is a this is a no save, and the owners were really struggling. Like this this house, they absolutely adore, but they were being told there's no way to do this. So the preservation board and I convinced them otherwise. <laughs> and one of our preservation board members is actually the contractor and offered his services, a, you know, best rate he can, I guess, but he's working there day and night right now, right now. Um, and so they've, they've had to put a whole new roof on. They're, they're resawing members for the siding. It's going to be simply stunning. They're going to uh, remake the intricate railing detailings using molds from existing ones. It's really amazing. And it already looks a thousand times better inside just with all the uh, fire debris out of the house, which was really sad to see. But that's gonna be stunning. And we'll do um, a huge ribbon cutting when this is done. Um, Northwest 14th Avenue. So one of the successes that I'm super happy about is that since I came here a year and a half ago, I really wanted to make sure that demolition permits that are submitted to the city all the time, if they were of properties of a certain age, I wanted them to run through me, even if they weren't designated. I wanted to have eyes on what people were asking to demolish at 50 years or older. And this one came across a few months ago. And I was just like, there's nothing wrong with this house. And why, why? so I, I met with the owner on site and, and found out the situation. I, I was like, please, can we just meet before I sign off on this building permit? And I can't really hold up a building permit too much if it's not designated. So my only chance was to talk sense to him. So I met him on site and I found out that the reason he wanted to demolish is because he wanted to sell the property. I'm like, okay, okay, so sell it with the house. He's like, no, no, it'll be worth more. It's just, just, a, just the lot. I'm like, I'm telling you, no, not. Like there are plenty of people looking for Restore restoration projects and cute little projects like this. Like people need this kind of housing. Uh, it wasn't easy, but I convinced him to give it a few weeks. He had a contract in a week. He had a contract offered to him in a week because he went ahead and put it on the market with with the house. Of course, somebody snapped it up. But the key is just like just having face-to-face -face conversations with people. 
is super important in this business, especially when you're coming from the government side. Nobody wants to talk to you. Nobody wants to talk to me, and I'm really nice, I promise. But, um, <laughs> and these people can vouch for that. <laughs> But it's true, people have great distrust for the city and they get in their heads, they just like, I just want my permit, I just want my permit, just issue my permit. And that's that's a lot of the mentality that I'm faced with. So I'm so thankful the city is was fine with me being a part of the review process on demolition permits. So this, that one's being saved. Another thing that I find a big success is our re-engagement with the University of Florida's Historic Preservation Division. Um, and there's Cleary Larkin, who is the current head of the Historic Preservation section over at the School of Architecture, uh, sorry, uh, Design, Construction, and Planning. Um, but this is an example, this is just one example of how we're re-engaging with the university in an effort to save more districts and save more neighborhoods and do more things. So this is a graduate students project to survey and identify all the church houses it, that are still left in Gainesville. Um, it's possible to do like a thematic resource district. A thematic resource district means it's not a typical district where it's all one little neighborhood or one contiguous thing. It's properties that are tied together from, with a theme, or in this case, a, bu a building material. So ch church houses are so rare now in Gainesville because a, a lot of them have been torn down. So it would be nice to have, identify the different locations of the, the ones that are left and possibly protect them. But her research is going to be totally invaluable to us. And she's actually defending her thesis in a couple of weeks that I'm attending. Um, the other thing we're doing with the, um, well, I'll get to that, but we're, we're doing some grant work with the University of Florida. And also the University of Florida has offered to have their students provide um, computer models of like what our downtown would look like completely built out at current code. The 11 stories that are allowed right now, do you wanna know what downtown Gainesville would look like if it were completely built out like that? Uh, well, but if you saw it, then you there might be more effort to protect it. So that that's gonna be really great to work with their students because some of that stuff, our current staff does not have the um, capacity to, to do all that extra stuff right now. So anything, any help we can get. Uh, this is a little church in the Porter's neighborhood, which is uh, kind of south near Depot Park. And Porter's is another African-American uh, neighborhood, not protected, not designated, but at least this church is moving through the National Register process. It's gonna be listed, hopefully, it's gonna be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It already went through the state review and passed with flying colors. And so now it's on to the federal level for review. Old Mount Carmel Baptist Church. This is in back in the Pleasant Street Historic District. And this is a phenomenal church with an incredible civil rights history. Um, it's, it's pretty neat architecturally. It's kind of got these late Gothic revival uh, elements like the cross gable roof and the pointed arches and the brick pilaster, pilasters engaged on the, on the fa facade there. But it's still kind of, you know, a modest, a modest church in a modest neighborhood. But what happened here was so significant that it's recently been listed on the National Register of Historic Places and became a state heritage site, got its historic marker. Um, the University of Florida, in conjunction with the city of Gainesville, applied for a grant last year from the state and got it to help them do an architectural assessment of what this building would need because it's it's really in bad shape. The roof is falling in and all this stuff. So we got the grant and then had 
a charrette. A charrette is like a neighborhood workshop where you invite all the neighbors around that property and you offer them like different solutions to the problem. You ask them what would they like to see happen at this at this location and you really get a lot of community input for how to move forward with programming and you know, I mean, restoration is restoration and there's a specific way we like to do restoration on historic buildings. But as far as programming and what they would like to see happen at this site, the neighborhood really had a great time at that charrette. Here's some more photos of the interior. You can see the roof, the ceiling has all fallen out. <clears throat> but this was, oh, let me go back just a second. Um, the gentleman in the center, so that's Reverend Mayberry on the left. He's still preaching, but not at this particular church. He was at this church many years ago. And the gentleman on the right is Pastor Duncan. He's the current pastor for this church. And the gentleman in the center, Reverend Wright, was the president of the NAACP during the 1960s. And this church was ground zero for all those activities. Um, the planning and the meetings and the rallies and just so, so incredible. So we did the charrette, we did the grant and they have just received a National Trust for Historic Preservation grant for $200,000 to fix that roof and get this building watertight, which is the first step in saving a building. You gotta keep the water out. You gotta keep the weather out. Another thing I'm very proud of and a success is that last year we held the first annual Historic Preservation Awards. And you might notice one of the recipients there. So I think that's a great thing for the Historic Preservation Board to take on and just really recognize the people and the projects that have happened in the city of Gainesville that are valuable to us. The people are valuable and what the projects they've worked on are valuable. Now that is all. And if you'd like, I can answer questions. I also have a Friends of Preservation e-blast that I mail out, e email out about once a month. If you'd like to be on that list, you can take that, um, my email and just let me know what email to send it to. I also have uh, business cards up here if you want those. So thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for updating us on historic preservation in Gainesville. I have a couple of comments. Um, in the 70s, we sought to have the buildings around the square downtown designated a National Historic District and we were turned down at that time because three sides of the square had burned, uh, which meant um, there, the, there were lots of uh, issues in terms of integrity, which is a key word in terms of designation, both at the state and national level. Um, now, this is uh, 60 years later, uh, so, <laughs> most of the buildings that still exist would meet the 50-year um, suggested, uh, not, not ironclad uh, requirement. Uh, but that was why we were turned down uh, in the 1970s, lack of integrity because of, again, three sides of the square had burned over time. Uh, the other comment is with, with, with respect to the uh, church and brick structures, uh, about that same time in the 1970s, the city uh, commissioned, uh, there were two participants. One was called ERLA, E-R-L-A, and I think the other was called the History Group to uh, do uh, a survey of Gainesville. And I recall that uh, their conclusion was that the single most distinctive thing about Gainesville architecture were the uh, church and brick structures. Um, and um, so I'm glad to know that you're working on that. They're actually, you know, scattered all over the county. There's one out on Newberry Road, fairly far out, but they're hidden here and there. 
But again, that was their conclusion. That was the single most distinctive thing about Gainesville architecture. Cleary and I actually found a few out in Archer. We were out in Archer for a historic marker dedication at a cemetery, and we found a few more church houses out there. So we know they're out there. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I can take the mic to Okay. Now. This helps our Zoom people here. Thank you. Uh, we are new to Gainesville. What is shirt? Oh, great question. I'm so sorry. Chert, let me go back to this slide. Oh, wait, let me share it again. Oh, okay, sorry. It's the building material that looks like rock. It is made of limestone. It's like a local material made from local limestone, and it is a very distinctive look. Let me go back. No, no, uh, Jay. <laughs> Believe it or not, it is essentially limestone boulders that have been broken up. And inside you see uh, wonderful colors, pieces of flint, fossils in it. But it is just literally dug up in the ground all over. And the majority of it in Gainesville came out, a, out of uh, quarries out here where the Oaks Mall is right now um, for phosphate mining. And it was a byproduct. So during the 20s and 30s, it was just dug up, given away to builders, and it was a cheap building material at the time. I believe Jay is the current head of the city uh, preservation board. He is, the, he is the chair. Yeah. So we uh, rely on him for all kinds of expertise. <clears throat> it, it truly is the very meaning of like a vernacular material, something that was from the local area, used by local builders, and really reflects the environment and the nature of this town. I've got a, I've got a question. Oh. <clears throat> well, first, I have a comment and then a couple of, a great presentation. Thank you. I'd like to know if we can get a copy of that map that you had shown that has the historic, the five historic districts. Where can we get a copy of that? It's online, but I can also it's email it. And, and I'm letting you keep a copy of the um, presentation. Okay. And But I can email the actual map okay. also. Then I have a <clears throat> question and then a comment. Also, the question is, you showed us that 11-story building, which you think is going to have lots of uh, students in it, in that neighborhood where it doesn't fit at all. How responsible is the university for a building like that? Do they have any? No, it was a private developer. Okay. Okay. Private so developer, and they were offering 20% um, of the units to be more affordable. And because they're offering a more affordable chunk of units, the city commission sees that, equates that as affordable housing, which, okay, we do have an affordable housing issue in this community. We really do. But the typical family that needs affordable housing is never going to live in a student building. Right. It's not, that's not what their hopes and dreams are. Like they're, they're, they're really wanting to have their first home, no matter how small it is. And, but, you know. Okay. And the other thing is I do, I do miss sweet berries on 5th and uh, 13th. And last comment is you mentioned in that, that there were probably in that army, the place where the soldiers went, you mentioned there were probably a, a lot of weddings that took place. I bet there are a lot more children <laughs> than weddings. That yep. came out of those, out of that place. Probably so. <laughs> and thank you for bringing up Sweetberries because I kept referring to the Pleasant Street Historic District, but um, west, just west of 6th, from 6th to 13th, where Sweetberries was, is what we call the 5th Avenue District. It's not yet protected. It's not yet designated, which is, which, but it also contributed to that original African-American neighborhood that, includes Pleasant Street. 
But because it's because that half is not yet protected, there's no real way to prevent that kind of development from creeping in. Well, and Sweetberries is relocating just a couple blocks away, isn't it? Kathleen, you seem to be born for this, and we're very, very happy that you're working on it. Uh, because of COVID, I wasn't out very much. And now when I drive around town, I'm absolutely blown away by the buildings that come right up to the edge of the sidewalk and the height, and they just seem totally out of place. Just a quick question. How long ago were some of those buildings approved? Because they certainly weren't approved by the current administration. Most of the ones that you see up now were, they started, what, five, six years ago? Like um, the one right across the street from the university, the standard. And it takes a year and a half, almost two years for construction. Um, but the... We just had a turnover in commission and three new commissioners, and they were the ones that did the final approval on the 12 story building. So I, I, I don't know what to tell you about who's who's voting for what. And, you know, they're my bosses, so I have to play nice, but um, you can draw your draw your own conclusions. Kathleen, you got a heckler up there. You might want to read that oh. comment. I'm teasing you. Okay. You see oh. the comment in the chat? Great. <laughs> oh my gosh, my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Here? Hi, dad. <laughs> okay, so I... I, I have a, a story that... Oh boy, uh, here we go. Story time. It, it, it's relevant to two people in this room, um, but it also tells us something about how far we've come uh, over the last uh, 60 years, um, there was a very large, significant house um, standing in the duck pond, and um, uh, the, the uh, developers who bought it uh, sought permission from the city to demolish it uh, to put up, I believe, some uh, three or four story apartments. Um, <clears throat> the uh, city did not approve the permit. And so this, what has happened all over the United States happened on a Saturday night, the developers brought in a, de a demolition team and during the uh, wee hours of uh, Sunday morning, demolished it, believing that uh, once it was gone, the commissioners would cave and issue the permit for the apartment building. Well, the city commission did not cave. And so uh, the vacant lot remained there for some years until uh, Henry uh, and Nelson Logan came to town and uh, working with Jay Reeves, Henry and Jay designed the uh, very compatible uh, home that's there today, which uh, is now the home of Robert Dean's son and his family. So there are some good things that happened, and that was certainly an important one because of the timing. Uh, I, I think it, it taught developers that you could not do it that uh, easily, demolish something and get away with it. Oh, he, you know, Professor Hunt, as I know him, um, says that it was such an honor for him to introduce me, but that's so ridiculous because everything, well, no, everything I know about preservation came from my parents, clearly. But Professor Hunt had a really big part of my life because he taught my preservation law class. And he taught me how to write a historic preservation ordinance. And I don't know if you really know this, but as soon as I left, grad school, I moved to Tallahassee and I was working for the state historic preservation office. But after that, I went on to the town of Lake Park in Palm Beach County, where I wrote their preservation ordinance and started their preservation board. And then I went to the city of Fort Pierce, where I wrote their preservation ordinance because they didn't have one and started their preservation board. And it was all the stuff he had taught me. 
So, and then I went to city of Miami and rewrote their preservation ordinance and did the same thing at the county. So every position I've had, uh, I guess the ability to understand ordinance language and what needs to be in a preservation ordinance for it to be effective all came from him. I, I think she's been practicing law without a license. <laughs> Any but other questions thank, on Zoom? Or thank here? you. You've been a great, great audience. Nobody fell asleep on me. I'm super pleased about that. I was, I was, um, you'll find this very amusing. So I was giving a presentation to my, my, our code enforcement officers. And our code enforcement officers are an interesting bunch. Like, you know, they have to go out in the field and they have to be the bad guys and they have to do all this stuff. And sometimes they're, confronted with very irate people and but they are my eyes and ears on the ground out I, I can't be in all five districts at the same time even though I try so I was giving them this this uh workshop actually and I had these manuals for them about what they needed to know about preservation and where they fit into our preservation ordinance and the authority my preservation ordinance gave them because I don't really know that all of them knew that and we've had a lot of new code enforcement officers hired in the last few few uh, months so they're all they're all sitting there super interested and they're asking great questions and one of them starts snoring I'm like really <laughs> really and I'm trying not to notice it, but it's, oh my gosh, it was so funny. Yes, another question. Oh. Can you repeat that question? He wants to know if I'm optimistic about the future. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't optimistic. Uh, when I left, I left, I was the historic preservation chief for Miami-Dade County for 10 years. And they almost broke me. They all, I, I had great people I worked with, but the system, like just the system, and it was killing my love for preservation. And if he's, he's still, if he's still watching, oh, there's my mother. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is weird. This is like Twilight Zone stuff happening. Oh God, my father never forgave me. He will shake his head. He was so upset that I left my county position. You have young children, you had a salary, you had benefits. Blah, blah, blah. I started my own preservation consulting firm. And it was a struggle. It really was the first year and a half, but I did that for five years and it was the best thing I could have done because it rekindled my love for preservation. Why? Because I was out doing actual projects. I wasn't sitting in commission meetings all day and arguing about losing my staff and having my staff cut out from under me on a yearly basis and having my salary cut, like all kinds of stuff. I was doing real preservation. I was doing architectural assessments and I was doing designation reports for people and I was doing um, cultural resource assessments for Miami-Dade Expressway Authority and I was doing really really neat projects. Uh, I did a bunch of historic surveys for Delray Beach, the city of Delray Beach. So you know the city of Gainesville called and they're like hey <laughs> and Jay had a lot to do with that because he was actually on my Zoom interview and I was looking at him like, Jay, what are you doing on this Zoom call? And he said, oh, I'm the chair of the preservation board. I said, oh, so as soon as that call ended, I call him up, I'm like, tell me the real scoop. No, tell me what it's like to work in that government because I'm done with government. But they convinced me to come back and I, and I absolutely love it here. All my family that you see behind me, everybody's a gator, including my brother. And they, my mom and dad met in Gainesville. So I yeah. have a technical question. Uh, these recent uh, National Register designations like Mount Carmel Baptist Church, are, be, are they being designated at the local or the state level of significance? 
Um, the Mount Carmel was designated at local, although we feel it could have had national significance actually, but it was a sure thing to get in at the local level. So we did it that way. Mount Carmel is protected locally through the district. The other church that's in Porter's is not protected, but it is also being proposed as a local, local significance. Questions from the peanut gallery on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I hope somebody's recording this. Oh my God. Well, Kathleen, thank you for being with us. It's been very uh, informative and stimulating. Thank you. So, uh, and I'm happy to return next year to give you an update on where, on where we are.